All right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, my talk today, um, my, the title of my talk today is Open CSAM or How Secure is uh, Your Stuff in Electronic Lockers. Um, some information about me, as mentioned, I do a lot of hardware hacking, so I, I call myself security researcher. And primarily what I do is I look at uh, wireless and embedded devices and especially like security and privacy of them. Um, I'm a huge vacuum robot collector, so I have, a, you know, I think it's, by, by now it's like 60 robots, like different kinds of robots, so from all kinds of brands. And my interest is like reverse engineering of interesting devices, um, like robots, smart speakers, flash memories, or like everything, which is kind of interesting. Um, some projects which you might know is like um, my work with routing of robots. Um, so I basically buy random devices from, you know, places. I analyze the security and privacy, find ways how to route them, figure out how to use the sensors, and document them, and have like multiple racks like these, uh, where basically, you know, if I need to test something, I just go there, grab one, um, and can test uh, exploits. Um, I was doing already some work with um, smart locks before. Um, um, I was part of a team which uh, was publishing a paper in 2013 at ACMCCS about the security of Siemens and Foss, um smart locks, which you find in a lot of universities or like public places in uh, Germany. Uh, another thing, uh, when I was in the US, I was looking at locks uh, from the company Schlagi. Um, like they have also electronic locks, which are super expensive and they claim to be super secure, but you know, there's always uh, problems there. So um, let's talk about the goals of this talk today. Um, I would like to give you some information um, about the reverse engineering of Digilog locks. Um, so that we learn about the vulnerabilities, um, then um, I will talk about methods how to extract firmware and configurations. And one important thing is I want to raise awareness about pin numbers in particular. Um, as a side note, um, for this talk, I, I'm talking primarily of, uh, as, uh, about Digilog as an example. And I'm not claiming that they are more or less secure than other companies. Uh, where they, they're just kind of you know, unlucky that they had a good reputation, or they still have a good reputation, hopefully, um, and um, in regard to the, the quality of their products. Um, and also as information, the uh, company is also actively working on fixing issues and like, preventing them in the future. Um, okay, so uh, some things uh, before the talk itself. Um, so I will focus on very specific devices which, have, which are one wire-based and offline locks in particular. Um, and I don't cover particular topics. Uh, for example, I don't cover last gen logs, which are slightly different. Um, I will not talk about uh, details about audit logs and management software because it's not really relevant for the point I'm making. Um, also things about reprovisioning where you know you can reset logs and uh, destructive attacks uh, like drilling, decapping, and other things. So typically I try um, to keep devices in, in one piece if I you know, reverse engineer them. All right, uh, let's talk about the motivation. So um, hacking electronic locks is not that new, actually. I mean, it's like there for, for many, many, many years. And uh, you, you see always like news about like, you know, high security locks hacked by hackers, uh, you know, timing attacks. And a lot of researchers are, are looking on high security safe locks. And um, why is it so interesting? Because, well, you can do like research on side channel attacks. Um, safes contain typically expensive things. So if you find, you know, bugs in them, then the, big, uh, the impact might be very, very big if they're insecure. Um, one general problem which you see with, uh, with locks in particular, um, it's very hard to defend against an attacker who has physical access to something and uh, who is highly motivated. So um, for me, for example, I mean, I have a limited time. If I need to spend a month to break something, then it's a difference than um, someone who has like maybe just one day to, to find, find a problem. Um, another thing is that uh, consumer locks, safes, and cabinets are known to be bad, right? So there's like a lot of mechanical flaws. Uh, trivial bypasses, uh, the SIG software is insecure, it's like software based. And I have like, I found an example which is uh, from one of my favorite YouTubers, Stop Picking Glory, of like a gun safe, where uh, you put a gun inside, it's like a, you know, pin code and everything, and then you can just remove like a small plastic kind of thing and, you know, you just pull the gun out of there. <laughs> so, and this is like kind of like um, the state of the industry for this kind of locks, just to give you like some idea of what's going on. So what was the motivation to work on Digilog in particular? Um, I, I was at Northeastern University in 2018, and so the university started to roll out lockers in the lab. So basically it was like kind of co-shared spaces where they wanted people to, you know, kind of use desks, and if they don't need to, if they don't need to use the desk, they should just put the stuff away. So the use case of these lockers were, well, if you're done with your work and you go to the weekend or just don't, don't use the thing, 
Is that me, is it? I didn't, I didn't touch the cable, I swear. Ah, okay, good. Okay, so the use case of these logs is, um, well, after work, you put, you take all your stuff, your laptop, everything, your documents, put it in the locker, enter, the, enter your pin, and, you know, lock the lock, and, you know, just go home and come back later to take it out. Um, also, I saw, uh, when I visited many companies like Amazon, I saw the, these kind of lockers also in their co-working spaces. And one interesting thing for me was, I see it also in a lot of hotels. So, um, Marriott apparently, in many, like, Marriott branded, like, hotels and moxies in Germany, you see these lockers, like, next to the reception. Um, and, you know, the more you see it, the more you kind of get curious, like, what's going on. So, why do we want to hack lockers or cabinets? Well, these kind of lockers and cabinets are everywhere, and safes typically are not that, you know, often in public places, at least. Um, so, these lockers are used in public spaces or in shared workspaces, so you can get very easy access to them. And sometimes, you know, people are kind of, you know, forgetful. They forget their pin, they forget their keys, or they're part of a red team who do the do penetration test. So, you know, um, it's kind of would be interesting to, to hack these devices. And also, at some point, you need to kind of correct audit blocks of blocks. So there might be many, many um, use cases for that. Also, the interesting part here is it might contain interesting stuff, including your own. For example, if you think about what people store typically in their lockers, uh, backpacks, laptops, IDs, phones, keys, money, credit cards, USB sticks, documents, um, gold coins, and uh, your critical uh, sweet uh, storage, sweet uh, emergency, like, you know, candy. Um, and so if you think about that, how likely is it that whatever pin you use to lock the locker is also used for your phone, for your Windows, like, hello login, your credit card? There is some particular chance that people, you know, recycle their pin all the time. Just as a, you know, quick survey, who knows someone who uses a pin in multiple places? Just maybe, okay, okay, someone, oh, oh, okay, so, someone honest, um, who's lying? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so another question is like, um, how do I get these kind of locks? Well, um, typically for my experiments, I need multiple device devices, and I obviously don't want to use someone else's property, especially not university property, because they will get mad at me. Um, one of the problems is these locks are kind of expensive, so the lock itself is like around 100 US dollars, and the keys are um, you know between 50 and 100, depends on what kind of key you get. Uh, one thing which kind of helped, and I think this is like one of the few cases where someone can say that um, COVID kind of helped me. Um, part of the reason was many gyms closed to due to, to, uh, to, to the pandemic, so eBay was full of uh, surplus locks. So I was able to get a lot of um, you know surplus locks on eBay um, that actually fresh still out of the box. Sometimes I found even received into that where they got it like a couple months before, like still didn't unpack. So that was a very good case for me to to get uh, locks. All right. Let's talk about the um, Digilog ecosystem. So Digilog itself, um, they kind of do business as uh, Digilog, but it's actually securitypeople.inc. Um, and it's a US-based company with some subsidiaries in Europe and in uh, Asia. And they exist surprisingly for more than uh, 40 years. I think they were found in 1981. Uh, and they claim to be the global leader of keyless uh, lock solutions. Um, they have many different types and brands of locks. They have like, connected locks, offline locks, mechanical locks. Uh, and as an access medium, you can use things like um, RFID pens, keys, smartphones, like so ELE. And some brands which you see typically is like Digilog, Next, Numeris, but there's other, others. I have here some examples of, of uh, some of their locks. Um, so typically, how you can identify them is if, you, if they have like this weird kind of connector with three kind of pins, that's typically like uh, usually for Digilog. Um, some industries where they're in, um, like workspaces typically, um, they're in education, so you see them all the time in universities, uh, health, fitness, and hospitals, um, but also interestingly, manufacturers and government. Uh, and if you look, go to their website, they kind of tell you like openly which companies are using them, which is kind of, you know, nice. So, uh, in, in all of the Amazon offices I kind of visited, we, uh, you know, we're somewhere. So it's kind of like a general thing. Uh, if your company is on here, so maybe you'll remember them too. Okay. Um, so how do, how do the locks actually look like? So on the left, I have like an example of um, a lock um, with on the left side the outside part, so the pin part where you can enter the pin, for example, or tap the RFID. And on the right, you see like the uh, inside part of the lock with the batteries, which is kind of like on the inside of the door. 
If you take a closer look at the hardware, uh, even over multiple generations, all logs are very, very similar. They use the same type of MCU, so microprocessor. Uh, they have, uh, some of them have like an audit function, but I didn't find any of the logs which have like a read time clock, so they, uh, I'm not sure that they can actually keep time. Uh, one thing which kind of surprised me is that they don't have any temper switch, so if you disassemble one of the logs or disconnect one from power, then they don't notice that, which is kind of maybe not good. Um, and uh, they have more or less all the same interface to the latch, so they kind of recycle a lot of things. Um, one thing which was kind of interesting is that the state of the lock, like basically if it's locked or unlocked, is controlled by the latch, which is inside the door. So if you somehow can manipulate that sensor, then you can just, you know, the lock will think like, oh, hey, I'm unlocked, and, you know, uh, you can unlock it by relocking it, kind of. So there's like a couple, couple tricks there. Um, however, they thought about a lot of things, like bypassing and everything, so they, they added some good protections against physical attacks. Also, uh, the software features which the locks have is kind of depending on the brand. So some of the brands are more premium. They support a little bit more. Uh, but technically, it's kind of like the same hardware. Um, speaking of the hardware here, um, I have like an example. Um, they uh, thankfully have a debug interface inside. So if you open the lock, which is like four screws, basically. Uh, they have a PIC-18 MCU. They have an EE PROM for the devices which have the audit functions. Um, they have a connection to the latch inside and a piezo and uh, the one-wire interface. So... They use a special kind of thing where the, 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 the connector itself has power, uh, one wire and ground, and the reason is so in case the lock is dead, that you can power it from outside with like a battery. Um, if you take a closer look generally about uh, of all the products, then one thing which we notice is that they like pick MCUs. Uh, so the um, the BC crowd often pick 18 uh, chips, but also like in the last gen, pick 24. Um, they use more or less the same uh, EE prompts for, for audit functions, and they, for RFID, they have um, some chips which can do that. And also, in the newest generation, they use like a Legic uh, chip, which has an HSM on board and a BLE, which apparently we also use um, you know, in the latest generations. So, um, we need to talk about the keys itself. So, uh, even though that you use a PIN, uh, and or you can use an RFID, they have like keys uh, for provisioning, basically. Um, one of the keys is the programming key, which is the yellow key one. Um, and this key only exists once. So just to give you an idea like how big they are, so this, they have like a battery in, in it. And so this key, um, you have only one of them per, per system, and you use it to um, add or remove manager keys. Um, you can use this key to um, open a lock, for example, if someone forgot to pin, or if you want to need to audit the lock inside, like for example, you know, in schools where you need to check that no one has contraband in the, in the locker. So you can use it to relock again. Um, it has a battery, so it can power a deadlock, and you can have also like some additional functions, like you can clone configurations, you can do some auditing and some other things. Um, the manager key, uh, which is like a, a black color, um, it's uh, you can have multiple of them. So typically, like some administrators have it, and you can open locks with them, uh, and you can relock them again. So you know you can look inside, relock it, and the same pin is still active, and you can use it to power. Then we have the blue key, which is the ADA key. Um, ADA is um, American Disability Act, I think. So that's kind of like an American thing where if people are not able to enter a PIN, like because they have a disability or if they cannot tap a card, you give them like one of the blue keys. And so they just have to somehow find a hole and just press the button. And that allows people with disability who have like shaky hands to basically use the lockers. And it's basically like an alternative to PIN or RFID. And there's some super special magic keys, which are replacement programming keys in case you lose the programming key, um, which allows you to reset um, the lock somehow if, you know, you forgot the key, uh, lost the key, basically. Okay, so let's take a look inside of these keys. Um, the programming and manager keys are more or less the same. Interestingly, price-wise, they are, like, very different. So I think the manager key is, like, 50 bucks, the other one is 130. Uh, but the hardware is more or less the same. Um, the, uh, they have a 9 volt battery in there. They use a PIC-18, so basically the same stuff as in the locks. And they have also a programming interface, thankfully. Um, the ADA key itself uh, has um, like a DS2401, which is just an I button. You know, it may be from KeyFobs. Um, and it just stores like a 48-bit ID. So how do the keys communicate? They use one wire with um, the lock, right? So every time you um, tap the, the key, um, just use one wire. And it's extremely easy to intercept with a logic analyzer, right? So you can just tap into the wires and just read. Um, what we do is like we use the read ROM command. And, um, if, um, you know, you use that, then you get basically eight bit, uh, eight byte of ID back from the, from the key. 
um, which is technically not really 8 byte, it's like 7 bytes plus one CRC byte. Um, the way how the lock knows what kind of key you have is by an ID, of, uh, the, the first byte of the ID is basically either 01 for the ADA key, 04 for programming key, and 014 for, uh, sorry, uh, 14 for the management key. And uh, the bus resets after um, every transaction, which, you know, we might use later on. One thing which was kind of interesting for a system that widely used that they don't use any crypto or challenge response or anything else. So basically, it's just plain one wire ID, you know, sending back and forth. So, um, I want to give you like a quick intro about PIC MCUs because I'm not sure that everyone is like from a hardware field. So I just want to kind of give you like a quick rundown of, you know, what we're talking about. So, um, PIC MCUs are like a, a, a microcontroller uh, from microchip, and um, they're extremely common for locks. So you find them in Siemens of Force, Schlage, Aquari, like everything which is uh, which was manufactured in the last 15, 15 years has likely that this uh, the PIC controllers. The advantage is that they are super low power. So basically, you can run these kind of locks on a, on, a, uh, on batteries like for years. So that's the reason why they uh, they use, and they're also very cheap. Uh, the PIC-18 itself is like an 8-bit MCU, which was released in uh, 2000, and it's still used today, surprisingly. Um, the config stored, uh, is stored in Flash um, after the programming, and you can configure a couple of things. For example, you can enable or disable debugging. You have a brownout protection, so if you try to kind of do some power measure, uh, power tricks, uh, the, the thing would reboot. And you can enable protections for the Flash memory itself. All right, um, so... The PIC 18F 25K20 is like the one which is which is used in the, in the locks, and you just need to kind of take a quick look at the flash memory. Well, generally, uh, these chips have like 1,536 bytes of SRAM, so that's not megabytes, that's bytes, uh, 32 kilobytes of flash, and uh, 256 bytes of EEPROM. And typically, that's for most use cases, that's totally fine. Um, as mentioned, as protections, they have um, code protection, which um, I will talk about later, byte protection and extended block uh, table read. And the way how it works typically is if you have a one, that means that the protection is off, and if you have a zero, it means the protection is on, and you only can transition from a one to a zero, but never from a zero to a one. Um, and on the right, you see basically this, this scheme how the um, flash is kind of stored so, uh, or structured. So you have the boot block, you have the then block zero, one, two, three, and then um, you have the E prompt, which is kind of separate. All right. Um, I, w I would like to give you like some examples about you know how these protections work. So the first one, code protection, how it works is if you take um, a debugger and you attach it to um, to a, a pro processor. Um, if you have a, a block which is protected with code, uh, code protection, then um, you wouldn't get any data back from it. So you, you would get basically zeros back. And in this particular example, we enabled code protection for the boot uh, block uh, for block zero and for the EEPROM, and so you get all zeros back. But you would get back one, two, and three because the code protection is off. Um, another protection is the write protection. Same case, you connect a, the debugger to it. Um, we can't write into boot a zero or data because we enabled the write protection, but we can program the other ones. Now there's a special uh, protection which uh, these chips have, which is called the external block table read protection. And the idea here is that um, if you have a code on some block, um, the uh, if you have this protection is enabled, it will um, allow you to read from blocks which are not protected, but would prevent your code from reading from other blocks. So it's kind of like a thing. So if you have malicious code on one of the blocks, it cannot dump all the other blocks. So it's kind of like a thing. So in this particular case, uh, the code in block two can read block three, but it cannot read block one. Generally, security-wise, um, they this kind of chips, I mean, they're not military-grade hardware or something, so they offer some basic protections against attacks. And many attacks existed like for many, many years. So even if the protections are enabled, and the first ones were like in um, the optical uh, or laser attacks in uh, 2002, uh, there were like some tricks where people were decapping the, or removing the, the epoxy and kind of using UV light to reset the config uh, bits. There's glitching, there's like, you know, messing with blocks and some other things. So there's many, many examples. It's kind of well known that those chips are, you know, maybe not the best idea to, you know, for your high security application. But still, they're very, very um, uh, often used like in locking applications. Okay, let's talk about the attacks. Uh, so, what we are, are we generally looking for if we try to attack uh, locking systems? Well, one thing would be we would like to have the whole firmware so that we can find secret backdoors or bugs which we can use. Um, also, we want to understand functionality uh, if there's like some special modes which we can use for our attacks. 
And um, in some cases, uh, it might be interesting to create a malicious firmware, which kind of waits for a special pin, which does then other things. So, you know, if you have the firmware, then you can temper with it and, you know, you can just reflash it again. Um, the other thing which we're interested in is basically key IDs, for example, like for management keys, uh, user pins, uh, RFID IDs, or like lock, locks potentially. And, well, from a tech perspective, it would be also very nice to know if there's an easy way to open locks, like, you know, just swipe a magnet and the magic opens. All right, so let's start with the attack. So um, what kind of ideas would we have? Typically, well, we could try to dump the flash or the EEPROM. We maybe could uh, try to brute force pins and keys. Um, we can try some sidechain attacks, or we can see like if we can potentially clone keys. All right, let's try the first one. Well, the very naive approach would be like, hey, uh, if you can take the debugger and just hook it up to the to the debugging pins which we left for us, well, can we do we get something back? So they, it, it was extremely nice of them that they even labeled the debug pins, which is very unusual, um, but it was extremely helpful. So. Uh, what did we get? Well, most of the time we got zeros back because of, uh, the, for the keys at least, the program memory was protected and the EEPROM was empty, so there was nothing there interested, as interesting. But it wasn't protected necessarily, so it was just empty. For the locks, it was slightly different. So for the locks, um, most of the, the, um, um, the, the memory was protected, but they uh, had some leakage basically where they, which was not protected. So the program code squeezed off the, uh, out of the blocks and basically creeped into blocks which were not protected. And the EEPROM contained a lot of data, so which was kind of like uh, interesting. Um, also, the, the thing which I noticed is had like 12 locks which I was using for testing, and all of them had the same kind of issues, so no matter which generation it was, um, no matter you know which brand, so I think at some point someone 20 years ago did something and it's still there, so it's probably like some legacy issue. Okay, so why did we get some data back? Well. One thing which you can do is like you can read out the configuration bits, right? And so this is like a, a dump of the configuration bits. And one thing which you, you see is like, wait, so only the first two blocks are protected, but the other ones are not protected. Um, the bootloader is protected, but not the EEPROM. And nothing is write protected at all, so you can write, write to it. So which is kind of weird. To get back to my scheme, uh, my, my simplified version of the, of the, um, of the flash, uh, this is how it looks. So the the, uh, the boot block, the bootloader is protected. Um, the block zero and one is protected, uh, but not the other blocks. So as mentioned before, the, the the program code is like slightly squeezing out of the block one. So it's like it goes into block block two, which is not protected. So we might might be able to use that. And the data is completely readable. So that's that's an issue. So what can we do to get firmware in the in the block which is protected? Well. One of the ideas is we can tamper with block two, and one of the uh, the thing what we can do is like we can create a backup so that we can flash it back, then overwrite uh, block two with some instructions, which is basically an upslet, and write um, like basically pray at the end of the day that some instruction will be caught in that block, and uh, then at the dumper in block three, which basically dumps all the other blocks which are protected because the program itself can access everything; they didn't enable that protections and extracts all the contents over UART. For keys, we had the problem that uh, the, the code is too short. Basically, it was only a contained in blocks uh, 0 and 1, which was protected. So one thing I had to do is basically overwrite the code in block 1, which was destructive, extract the bootloader in block 1, and then use another key to overwrite um, block 1 and then dump block 2. So it's, uh, sorry, uh, block 0 and then dump block 1. So um, yeah, it was a little bit more complicated, but it was fine. So what was this, what was the result? Well, the extraction was successful. So basically, we got the firmware back for this thing, and um, with multiple keys, I was able to dump like more, like also the firmware for that. And for the big firmwares, it was basically non-destructive because you, you know you can read the the plain text and then just write it back. Um, so now we had the binary. We could analyze and modify it. Um, and um, just to clarify again, again, this 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 technique is like well known. Basically, everyone who ever works with pick chips kind of knows that it's like there's nothing new. It's just like you just use that. It's like kind of like a tool which but people know. All right, let's take a look at the EEPROM contents, which we are again not protected. Um, one thing uh, which I saw there is that the programming key ID is obviously in plain text. Like three bytes of the programming key ID are in the EEPROM. Then you have a number of management keys, and the manager ID keys, like the key IDs, are also in there. The other thing is your pin is in plain text in there, um, or like ADA key, or if you have an RFID, it's the same thing. So um, 
yeah, which is kind of like a problem because you can, like I said, you can dump that information. And another thing which is kind of interesting, there's a failed pin counter. So if you enter your pin three times um, in data, then basically it will lock for a minute or so. So another question is like, okay, this attack, I mean, it kind of requires that you need to touch the, the PCB somehow, so is there another way? So can we brute force the pins, for example? Well, one of the problems is that there's some rate limiting of pin entries. As mentioned, it will lock itself for a minute after one minute. But the good thing is we can actually glitch the power by just shorting the, the power line to ground, and this will reset the lock, and then we can just enter pins again. So um, it doesn't reset the reset counter, so it will lock itself again after you one try, but um, you can still you know try faster. And really bad things will happen if you try more than 255 times, because then some things get overwritten, and then magically you have magic key. Um, one of the things uh, what happens also is like the rate limiting doesn't apply to the one wire interface. So you can try as much as you want through the one wire interface and everything, you know, there's no limitation. Um, the only kind of limitation there is that uh, only specific first bytes are accepted. So it needs to start with 0, 01, um, 0, 04, uh, 14, like for the mantra key, uh, programming key, or like the ADA key. So then the idea was like, well, wait, so the lock only knows three bytes of the programming key, so not the odd eight bytes, only three bytes. Can we brute force that? Well, it turns out you can. So this is like our setup uh, with like an ESP32 and a logic analyzer, which is just measuring things. Um, you can observe the timing of the lock by one wire because you can just measure between the command and bus reset. So that kind of gives you like some timing. So you know that 250 millis uh, 260 milliseconds are for a correct ID or pin and 235 for an incorrect ID. But the problem is it kind of still takes too long because then, you know, it like takes a couple of days to kind of brute force that. You still need to brute force through three bytes of, of uh, random data. So as an alternative, you can use the ID comparison as a side channel because the, the timing depends on which byte is incorrect. So it's kind of slight, there's some slightly uh, glitch basically, um, which you can observe like to kind of figure out, okay, are you wrong on the first byte, second byte, or third byte? So it's significantly faster than brute force, so you can open it like in minutes, not days, basically. One of the problems you run into is like you have some jitter. Um, so there's some, you need to do some engineering, basically reset the locks from time to time because otherwise it gets stuck a little bit. But this uh, this works. So let's talk about emulation and cloning of keys. And this thing is super trivial because only you need only an ID to put the cloning and it's trivial to dump. Also, it can be emulated very easily. You can use an Arduino, which you have in the, I think in the CTF outside to emulate a key, or you just use a flipper zero. Um, the pins are a little bit weird, but technically you can do that. So what are, what are other attacks on this lock? Well, um, you can clone the configuration via one wire. There's like some special mode which you need to bring it in, but you need also like the programming key for that, which allows you to dump all the, the manager keys from the lock. The other thing you can do is like you can modify the contents of the audit EEPROM. So in case you, you're part of sneaky people, you want to, you know, Make sure that no one knows that you open something. But the audit EPRO might be also interesting because it might have also pin numbers in it. Um, also, you can do more power glitching because you basically can control the power of the lock from outside. Uh, you can use um, also. All right. Let's talk about the development of the key. I have a sample scenario here where I think the company would be a little bit mad about me, but this is how it is. And the assumption here is that you have access to any open locker or cabinet in the whole facility or from the company. For example, if you're in a hotel, you need just one open locker. As tools, you require a debugger, a Phillips screwdriver, an Arduino, or a flipper. That's all you need. Uh, and what you do is like basically the approach to get the key, the, the, the manager key is uh, you remove two screws to detach the lock. Uh, you remove two more, between two and four more screws to open the lock and access the PCB. You attach the debugger, dump the flash, and then you're able to create a, a fake manager or programming key. And this whole thing, and it was timing that is like it takes less than typically less than a minute. But if you do it for the first time, it might take you up to two minutes. So, <clears throat> what do you get with that? Well, um, if you want to break into someone else's locker, obviously, is you use your fake um, programming or manager key to open the target locker. Uh, you do the damping procedure again to get the pin from whatever whoever locked the locker before. And you can tamper, tamper with the stuff inside, and afterwards you use the programming key again to just lock it again, right? So um, the thing is, if you use a programming or manager key, the pin or whatever credential was used to lock the locker remains the same, so no one will ever know that you did something sketchy. 
As a result, well, you have a special key for the whole system because this key will work for all the locks in whoever provisioned that system. And you know what pin was used to lock the target locker. Okay, so let's talk about some takeaway lessons, hopefully, here. Well, do not reuse an important pins for lockers, cabinets, or safes, or anything which you don't control yourself. Also, never borrow any um, anyone electronic keys, because most of them are kind of clonable, and I know from experience that some people love to clone hotel keys to get into particular launches. Um, be aware of some security limitations of these devices. Again, these devices are not military-grade, high-security locks, uh, bank, like bank walls or something. Uh, otherwise, people would store gold in them. So be aware, very aware of that. Also, do not, do not trust audit locks of, the, of that kind of devices. Because there might be ways to tamper with them, and uh, potentially you can frame someone that they took something which they might have, have taken. Um, also, even experienced and big companies make mistakes all the time, and producing a high-security but cheap device or uh, system is very difficult. Also, uh, one thing which I learned from that whole thing there might be interesting cyber-physical systems around you. So if you just walk through some places, and there might be something which might be interesting. One important lesson is don't don't forget the human factor. Uh, sometimes it's just required, you know, just ask nicely, like, hey, oh, I forgot my stuff in that locker. Can you just open for me? And then people are, want to be helpful and just do that for you. So um, there's no... Most of the time, you cannot use, like, only a technical solution to, you know, make things secure. So you need to also think about humans. So as a summary... We can extract firmware and keys from DigiLock locks. Um, also, that allows us to see like other kind of methods which we potentially use. Um, this attack might not work necessarily for the last gen locks which were released, I think, one and a half years ago. But realistically, if you think of lockers um, in a hotel, then probably the lockers will stay there for the whole you know lifetime of the, of the hotel, and uh, so you have like very long lo lifespans of these kind of locks. Um, access to one lock can give you access to all in one particular location. Uh, cloning and emulating keys is very easy, and attacks do not require complicated tools, and they are very, very cheap. Uh, again, as a reminder, they are not high security locks. Um, final notes, please do not break into lockers you don't own. If you own the lockers, um, be careful, because sometimes if you mess up things, you might just break them, which is especially embarrassing if the locker is locked. Um, there might be more attacks which are not covered here, so um, due to the time, I want to just kind of skip a couple things. And other and companies, uh, other companies and products are also vulnerable too. So just because someone didn't get hacked doesn't mean that they're good or secure. And typically, um, as mentioned before, there's a lot of stuff like, and especially consumer uh, grade, like safes and things, where people know it's broken, and so no one actually cares of like breaking it because it's kind of like it's a you know self-explanatory thing. So uh, yes, some acknowledgments. I would like to thank uh, Timstar, Shannon, Dan, Braylon, Zern, Xenia, and Kivara. And if you have any questions, I'm Happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, with what you've learned about uh, these digital locks, do you think that analog locks are more secure or less secure? Well, as someone who's doing lock picking for many, 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 many years, I, I don't think so. I mean, all kind of locks are have insecurities bypassing and stuff like that. So it's like it doesn't matter. It's just I think electronic locks are basically not necessarily more secure. They're just more comfortable for many people. Uh, you find always flaws. It's like go to the lock picking village outside. <laughs> This question here. Is it deliberate that there is no cryptographic checks after the of the lock, so you can just copy all the and use that on the other side? Yeah. So um, I was kind of surprised by that, um, but also to be honest, um, so I mean, this company is in, in, in on the market for like forty two years, right? And so um, one thing which I see quite often from companies which are on the market for a very, very long time and come from also from the um, mechanical lock perspective, they have systems like code which is like very, very old and crypto is expensive, like, like uh, both power and computation-wise. And 
at some point you run into the issue that then your check for like some crypto stuff is like just taking too long and there's like some, you know, corners which you cut and you run into the issue at some point that you need to be also backward compatible to old devices, which are maybe like 10 years old. So at some point people just decide like, um, maybe like, oh, okay, the ID will be good enough until someone takes a look at it. So it's a quite often scenario, basically. Um, it's, it's sad, but I mean, it, it is how it is, I guess. Any more questions? All right. Uh, yeah, if you have more questions, I will be here for longer. So uh, just find me for my logs if you want to play. Uh, if you want to uh, take your time yourself in sense of like figure out how quick you are with like dumping the key, uh, I have many logs with me. I have screwers and everything. So feel free to reach, reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.